Okay. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome to the second session of the morning. Uh, is it okay? Okay. Uh, my name is Toshihiro Horikawa, uh, Kyoto in Japan, and I'm also the guest researcher in Heidelberg. And let me announce uh, one thing from the Buber Gesellschaft in Germany. Um, Buber Gesellschaft has had only three sections philosophy, education, and psychotherapy. And coming these days, uh, we're going to start a new section, Bibel Wissenschaft. It's a Bible studies. And uh, I'm one of the coordinators. And this session is focused on these topics, Buber's biblical hermeneutics and religious studies. Uh, let me introduce two speakers, uh, f uh, first speakers first. Uh, first speaker is Professor Clea uh, Suffering from, Ye um, sorry, from Northwestern University. She finished her BA in Yale University and then finished PhD at, at Stanford University Department of Religious Studies with the dissertation entitled Martin Buber's Biblical Humanetics. Her latest publica publication is History, Myth, and Divine Dialogue in Martin Buber's Biblical Commentaries in the Jewish Quarterly Review 2000 in 2013. Now we are eager to listen to her pre presentation entitled um, Buber, the Bible, and Hebrew Humanism, Finding a Usable Past. Please. Thank you very much. And am I, it's working, the height and the microphone and, no? Higher. Okay, is that better? Okay, I'm not used to having to make microphones higher. It's a, uh, I'll pretend I'm tall. Um, so thank you for the introduction and I wanted to thank Sam and Paul. Um, the chance to spend two days with other people who know Buber's texts, um, as well as even better uh, than I do. It's really uh, very special. And um, as you heard, I'm at Northwestern, so I'm local. And I had um, a drive home last night, a drive back this morning. And I was thinking of a metaphor, trying to think of a metaphor for what this experience has been like. And it's sort of like working on a jigsaw puzzle for 10 years of your life and then discovering all of a sudden that somebody can take those same exact pieces and put them together in an entirely different way and you discover that uh, maybe, well, I won't say that you had the wrong image in mind when you put the puzzle together, but at least that it can make many different uh, quite interesting pictures. Um, so with that, so in his uh, recent book on American Judaism, our colleague Shaul Magid briefly touches on the phenomenon of Baalei Tshuva in the 1960s and 1970s as an example of the appeal of Hasidic teachings as a countercultural force. Central to this appeal was the presentation of Hasidism not by Hasidim themselves, but rather Hasidism as it appears in the writings of Martin Buber and Abraham Joshua Heschel. Magid comments, quote, thinkers such as Buber and Heschel served as bridge figures between young, Jewishly illiterate, but highly intelligent men and women and the spirituality, that's in quotes, of again, quotes, authentic Judaism. As an aside, uh, Jonathan Sarna actually in his book on American Judaism has a very similar sentence. As you might imagine, the difference is that that is all Jonathan Sarna has to say about countercultural counter Judaism. And of course, for Shaul, it's just a beginning. Anyway, the Judaism offered to Western Jews by Buber and Heschel was both foreign and familiar. In their most popular works, they combined the Hasidic texts and teachings of Eastern European Jewry with attention to the spiritual problems of the modern Western world. Buber, in particular, claimed that Hasidism represented one expression 
of an eternal essence of Judaism that was all too often absent from mainstream expressions of Jewish religion. In the Hasidic tales that he published in German in the early 20th century, and in his later presentations of Hasidism in various essays and books, Buber sought to distill that essence and then to re-present it. David Beale reminded us yesterday, of course, of Gershom Sholem's harsh criticism of Buber's presentation of Hasidism. But in response to Sholem and Sholem's students and others in, uh, let's call it the Sholem camp, Buber argued that his effort was motivated by, quote, a desire to convey to our own time the force of a former life of faith and to help our age renew its ruptured bond with the absolute. This is a two-part claim. The first part is that, especially in its early moments, Hasidism was a way of living truly before God with all of the virtues that such a life entails, such as unity of purpose and decision. Second, Buber is claiming that that way of life is captured in the teachings that survive it, namely in the stories told about and in the names of the Baal Shem Tov and other early teachers. We can find variations on this claim, both that in the past uh, there was this way of life and that this way of life or something about it or something of it is captured in text. We can find those two claims, that twin claim, in most, if not all, of Buber's works on Judaism. And it is a point that Buber's defenders, and I count myself among them, it's a point that Buber's defenders often return to in the extensive secondary literature on the buber Sholem debate. As Michael Fishbane reminded us yesterday, the other Jewish text that Buber loved and was devoted to was the Hebrew Bible. And it is actually in the context of his writing on the, he on the Hebrew Bible that we see Buber reflecting more precisely or more directly on the relationship between the past, history, and the present. In his commentaries, as I will discuss in a moment, Buber develops a hermeneutic method that relies on a certain understanding of how the Bible is a historical document. And he pursues, through his method, a narrative of what actually happened in this biblical past, or what we might say, what might be recognizable as a historical fact. But at certain other points in his commentaries, and sort of these moments appear interspersed within that historical narrative, Buber is after something a little bit more subtle. He calls it saga. What I'm going to talk, what I'm going to call it today or suggest that we think of it as is a usable past. So what I'll do, just to give you a, an overview, I'm going to review the commentaries and Buber's hermeneutic method that he develops there, and then move into the concept of a usable past and return again to some of Buber's writings on the Bible from elsewhere um, in his work. Buber wrote three biblical commentaries in the 30s and 40s, Kingship of God, Prophetic Faith, and Moses. In these books, he develops a hermeneutic methodology that depends on the interplay of two types of narrative within the biblical text, history, of course, and saga. In using the names history and saga, Buber is likely, almost definitely, borrowing from the biblical scholar Hermann Gunkel. Although he does not cite Gunkel in any of the passages in which he presents his method, and Gunkel deserves, or not deserves, but gets many footnotes elsewhere in the commentaries. And also in uh, typical Buberian fashion, he takes those terms and then gives them his own definition um, that I would say bears very little um, relationship to what Gunkel meant. Gunkel distinguished between saga and history in order to distinguish between oral legends that were later written down and literary records, or records written down at an earlier point, um, or, or records that exist, I should say, only in written form. In his use, Buber refers, uh, uses saga to refer to um, one type of record of an event, and history refers to a different type of record, both of them written. The first sort of narrative, history, according to Buber, demands an analysis that is similar to uh, historical philolo philological criticism, um, the sort that we call, generally speaking, historical criticism. It's a method that uses linguistic clues to locate and understand the biblical narrative as the product of an ancient Near Eastern context. 
this sort of narrative tends to focus on human beings doing rather ordinary things or expressing very concrete ideas about God, about being human, about being an Israelite, or simply about the world. The second sort of narrative is saga. Buber also calls it believing memory. Saga includes the more wondrous elements of the biblical story and describes, or in Buber's language, it is a view of reality that is refracted through the lens particular to the biblical person or the person of biblical times. That is, biblical accounts of divine speech and action, accounts of miracles, etc., are understood or are presented as the product, or they, I think the best word is almost they are the result, the text we have is the result of a human divine encounter filtered through the belief system of ancient Israelite society. The ancient Israelites were not aware, of course, that they had this lens or filter any more than we are aware of the way that our own particular worldviews and belief systems shape what we think, what we see, and what we experience. For the biblical person and people, encounters with God simply took the form of thunder and lightning, divine uh, presence, divine words, divine commandment. What the modern reader should treat as fact in these accounts is not those descriptions. Rather, what is fact is that the Israelites had a relationship with God, they had encounters with God, but beyond that, the exact details belong to a certain time and place, and we should not, as modern people, consider them to be either fact or fiction. They simply are a way of telling a story that is true to the experience of long ago. Did God ever speak directly to human beings, as the biblical text claims? We should remember that Buber himself suggests that it is impossible that God ever did so. In I and Thou, he states that he does not, quote, believe in God's naming himself or in God's defining himself before man. Revelation is there a sense of divine presence that is eternally true, or that possibility is eternally possible. And so saga is simply that event related as an ancient person experienced it, the way that a modern person would relate it would be different. And nevertheless, we have this text that bridges the distance or attempts to bridge the distance. Buber's account of the revelation at Mount Sinai in his book Moses illustrates for us the distinction between history and saga as two types of writing. Buber affirms that something happened at Sinai, but it was a natural or even ordinary event understood by an awestruck Israel, the people Israel, as wondrous. But if we focus on Moses, Buber separates the prophet of the saga teller or the prophet of the portions of the text that are saga from Moses the prophet as the historian or the history writer or the historical text portrays him. Buber writes, quote, Yonder Moses, who ascends the smoking mountain before the eyes of the assembled people, Moses, who speaks to the height and receives from the thunder and trumpet blasts a response, which he brings to his people in the form of commandments and laws, yonder Moses is not merely a stranger to us, which the real Moses also threatens to become at times when we sense him most. Yonder Moses is unreal. So the Moses who the biblical Israelites knew as the man who went up to God and brought back to them the commandments of that God, that Moses, Buber calls him unreal. Buber describes us, modern people, or his audience, let's say, modern people, he describes them as the late born, people who are, quote, oppressed by the merciless problem of truth. Such people, these late born people, cannot believe that Moses received the Ten Commandments at the top of a mountain as the Israelites experienced their encounter with God during an awe-inspiring, overwhelming thunderstorm. Modern people cannot verify this event. It is unreal, but it's not a problem because this event comes to us as saga. We are not to ask questions of factual reliability. But that's not to say that the entire episode is saga. 
Buber finds historical material in the steps that Moses takes to bring the Israelites into covenant with God, and in the content of those Ten Commandments, and in the stone tablets, the fact of the stone tablets upon which they were written. For Buber, Moses' great achievement is found in the steps that he takes to solidify the relationship of God and the Israelites, and his praise for Moses as a human being, as a leader, as really a religious visionary, his praise for Moses is almost a direct echo of Spinoza's in the theological political treatise. Moses is the great legislator who turned a motley group of tribes into a nation, who gave them laws and practices and customs that would bind them together. And Buber devotes many pages to a detailed and careful explication of the efficacy of Moses' decision and the ritual acts that he used in order to um, bring those people uh, together. As you know, in, back in the book of Exodus, shortly after the initial theophany at Sinai, and right after the people agree to the covenant, Moses, Aaron, Aaron's sons, and 70 elders of the people of Israel climb the mountain to see God. In Exodus 24, verses 9 and 10, we read, Moses and Aaron, Nadav and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel ascended, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there was the likeness of a pavement of sapphire like the very sky. So these verses present many problems. I'll give you just two of them. A problem within the biblical text itself is we've just been told that one cannot see God and live, and these people not only live, they get to have a celebratory meal. Second, we have a Buberian problem, which is that this is not Buber's understanding of the divine presence either. This should not be possible. Here's Buber's comment on the verses. I'm not going to solve the Bible's problem for us, but I'll, I'll tell you how Buber solves his own problem. He writes, the representatives of Israel come to see God on the heights of Sinai. They have presumably wandered through clinging, hanging mist before dawn, and at the very moment they reach their goal, the swaying darkness tears asunder and dissolves, except for one cloud already transparent with the hue of the still unrisen sun. The sapphire proximity of the heavens overwhelms the aged shepherds of the delta, who never before, who have never before tasted, who have never been given the slightest idea of what is shown in the play of early light over the summits of the mountains. This precisely is perceived by the representatives of the liberated tribes as that which lies under the feet of their enthroned melech, their enthroned king. And of course, the idea of God as melech is for Buber the heart of biblical uh, theology or biblical theopolitics, if you prefer. It's at the heart of what Moses has just taught them. Buber continues, in seeing that which radiates from him, they see him, capital H, him. Now they, that they have reached unto him, he, that is God, allows them to see him in the glory of his light, becoming manifest yet remaining invisible. All right, so they see the invisible God because they have been primed to see him, because they have arisen early on this very first morning after Moses came down from the mountain, after the covenant was sealed. And they see a great expanse of blue sky that comes as the clouds clear, and they see God, even as God is simultaneously, of course, on a factual, very basic level, invisible. I would say that Buber's presentation of what happened at that moment, those two paragraphs I just read, is itself a piece of saga. It's an extraordinarily beautiful piece of writing, even in translation. Um, and it stands really in contrast to the style of writing that we find in most of the Book of Moses. It's an extremely dry um, piece of book, piece of book, piece of writing. It's uh, full of arguments with the biblical scholars of the time, some of whom uh, people still read, many of whom have faded into obscurity. Buber, I think, recognizes this. He comments, just a few pages later, great is the work of the saga, and as ever, it still thrills our heart. Well, what are we to do with the thrill of the heart? Right? What do we do when we're moved 
by a piece of biblical writing, when we're moved by a modern retelling of a piece of saga. To simply sit and be thrilled is not enough. And I'd like to suggest that we can find a way of talking about what to do with saga um, with the term usable history, which is not Buber's term, but one that um, I'd like to bring into our conversation. And so I'm going to turn away from Buber for a few minutes to talk about uh, the idea of a usable history. Usable history is one of those ideas that uh, you sort of assume you know what it means, and uh, then you think to yourself, well, I wonder what other people think that means. And you discover that nobody, very few people, not nobody, but very few people have actually um, spent time defining it. But there's one person in the American context who, who does so and who most people end up uh, turning back to quite interestingly. And that's this literary critic by the name of Van Wyck Brooks, who in April 1918 argued in a very important essay that the arts thrive only when they are connected to a rich national past. In the America of his day, he argues further, historians tell story, American historians tell stories of a past in a way that does not give artists enough material to work with. Rather than a rich and varied national history of the kind that he imagines European writers have at their disposal, Americans are instructed by their historians to take pride only in the exploits of the pioneers who settled the country, while the other, more complicated, less positive strains of the American experience are generally denied, hidden from sight, or at best, aggressively undervalued. Brooks asks, quote, is this the only possible past? If we need another past so badly, and he does think that we do, if we need it so badly, is it inconceivable that we might discover one, that we might even invent one? He is building, although he doesn't directly cite, Brooks is building, of course, on Nietzsche's 1874 work, The Use and Abuse of History. Here, Nietzsche excoriates historicist approaches to the past. And you know, I, I'm about to say his harshest words are for X, Y, and Z, but it's, it's not really a fair claim. The whole book is pretty harsh. Um, but he has some harsh words for what he terms an antiquarian approach. The antiquarian approach to the past treats it solely as a source of meaning and identity in the present. Using such an approach, a person is, quote, careful to preserve what survives from ancient days and will produce the conditions of his own upbringing for those who come after him. In and of itself, there's nothing wrong with this. Indeed, part of any individual's identity or any nation's sense of itself will emerge from the past. Um, things such as where it came from, how it got to where it is, and again, whether it's an individual or a nation, one should be able to answer these questions. They are an important piece of who a person is. But an antiquarian approach can go awry. It can become a sort of a hoarding disorder in which one becomes consumed by remembering by collecting facts and facts and more facts with no consideration of whether or not these facts are important. In Nietzsche's language, quote, antiquarian history degenerates from the moment that it no longer gives a soul in inspiration to the fresh life of the present. He compares the degenerate antiquarian's traditionalism to, quote, the mad collector raking over all the dust heaps of the past he often sinks so low as to be satisfied with any food and greedily devours all the scraps that fall from the bibliographical table. I was once at a talk um, between, or it was a talk by a historian, and he was introduced by um, a rival historian. You know, they were friends and colleagues, but really rivals. And uh, the introduction basically said, My colleague is the very best person I know, it's sitting in the archive and collecting material. And it was one of those introductions where everybody clapped and then you sort of sat for a moment and said, I think that was just the greatest insult that could have possibly been lobbed by one historian at another, because it was exactly this description of the person who is so immersed in the archive that he never sifts to find what really matters and um, what does not matter at all. 
This approach to the past is stultifying, it is suffocating, it holds a civilization back from innovation, back from what Nietzsche calls, quite simply, life. A civilization that is consumed with its past will be consumed by its past. Nietzsche writes that history can and should serve life, creativity, even perhaps progress. Nietzsche writes that the good kind of history, or history writing, quote, has always a reference to the end of life, and not in the sense of euthanasia, but the purpose of life. And the good kind of history is always under the absolute, its absolute rule and direction. This is the natural relation of an age, a culture, and a people to history. Hunger is its source, necessity its norm, the inner plastic power assigns its limits. The knowledge of the past is desired only for the service of the future and the present, not to weaken the present or undermine a living future. Like Nietzsche, Brooks envisions a historical narrative that will serve a living present and future. But I quite specifically included his comment that if need be, we can invent our past so that the, that past will serve our present creativity. I don't think that Brooks is suggesting that we reference events that never happened or write biographies of people who never lived. Rather, what needs inventing are narratives, narratives that will choose particular events of the past and make sense of them together in such a way that they will inform the present in a productive way. Such narratives will pass over what is irrelevant, or at the very least, they will um, pass over what is irrelevant for, their, for the narrative they are creating, leaving facts um, there to be found by other narrative writers writing other narratives of the past. Quite interestingly, in the context of Jewish studies, there are a few specific examples of historians who refer to the idea of a usable past, or scholars, let's say, more broadly. And as a matter of fact, there is even a book called The Jewish Search for a Usable Past. It's written by David Roskies. And David Roskies, it's a wonderful book, but he never defines what a usable past is. Um, one of the, a different scholar who comments on his work suggests that what he means is, quote, a past through which one might refract the challenges of modernity. That's Abigail Gilman. That is, Roski's study, and he is working on literature, Yiddish literature, his study emphasizes moments in which the past was uh, narrated and specifically fictionalized such that the challenges of the storyteller's own moment could be addressed as though they had already happened and been resolved. Roski's study um, emphasizes novelists, storytellers. It is not at all about historians, but instead about open acts of create or acts that are openly creative. Um, and not surprisingly, he spends quite a bit of time on Sholem Aleichem. Well, what does this have to do with the Bible, which resides in this uh, Netherland, at least as Buber describes it, in some ways a piece of historical writing, in some ways a piece of myth or saga? in Hebrew Agadah. If we turn back to Buber, I'd like to point to his 1941 essay, Hebrew Humanism, where Buber claims that, quote, what the Bible has to tell us and what no other voice in the world can teach us with such simple power is that there is truth and there are lies and that human life cannot persist or have meaning save in the decision on behalf of truth and against lies. There is right and wrong and the salvation of man depends on choosing what is right and rejecting what is wrong. By bringing this short little paragraph um, into this talk, I'm inviting misinterpretation in a couple of ways. And the first is that I've just told you that the Bible has all these different types of writing, and now I'm telling you that Buber says that the Bible has truth and lies, or teaches us something about truth and lies. According to Buber, I want to be explicitly clear what the Bible teaches us is that in our own moment, there is truth and there is lies. It's not that there is truth and lies in the Bible. But in our own moment, as in any moment, there is truth and there is lies. And the, the Bible teaches us that we must distinguish in our own moment between truth and, or we must decide on behalf of truth and against lies. The other misinterpretation that I think this passage risks is that when he says that the Bible teaches us to choose what is right and to reject what is wrong, 
he is not making a reference to that often cited passage in which God tells the Israelites, right, make the choice on behalf of life, which is a choice to follow the commandments. The The black and white of the biblical message is not do what God has commanded you to do or what God has commanded your your ancestors to do. This is not that um, this is not a moment in which Buber backs down from his lifelong insistence that God does not command in an eternal everlasting way or that God does not command specific actions in an eternal way. What he means instead is that the Hebrew Bible and Hebrew humanism more broadly, so texts that follow in the tradition of the Bible, is a command um, to live that life of unity, that ever-elusive life of unity, to act before God with awareness that one acts before God at home, in the public sphere, in every moment that one is. So he means, or excuse me, so he writes that Hebrew humanism means, quote, reception of the Bible, not because of its literary, historical, and national values, important though these may be, but because of the normative value of the human patterns demonstrated in the Bible, the biblical actors um, set for us, according to Buber, norms of what it means to live in their situation before God so that we might live in our own situation before God. If we turn back to Moses and to Buber's careful explication of Moses the lawgiver, who of course presented his laws as commandments from God. If we turn back to Moses, Buber writes, these laws, quote, these laws cannot claim any priority over those which may be proclaimed later on. And when the people declare after the reading that they wish, quote, to do and to hear, na'asev and ishma, they clearly signify that they bind themselves not in respect of specific ordinances as such, but in respect of the will of their Lord who issues his commands in the present and will issue them in the future in the respect of the life relationship of service to him. In his 1949 essay, Children of Amos, B'nai Amos, or B'nai Amos, well, Buber admonishes those Jews who believe that the establishment of the modern state of Israel is equivalent to a revival of the spirit of Judaism or Jewishness, that the mere existence of a state is a sort of fulfillment of this renewal of Hebrew humanism. In this essay, Buber writes that, quote, the time has come for us to rescue the prophecy of Israel from the platitudinous. We should devote ourselves to understanding the real message of prophecy and place it, the true light in the world of man, over against the deceiving brilliance of what are called interests. The message of the prophets is truth. Only through justice can man exist as man, can the human remain human. The prophets are the heroes of a great humanistic tradition, one that should drive Jews not to the synagogue but to the streets demanding justice. God's words in the prophetic books fade into the power of the prophets to articulate a more general message that Buber wanted his audience to hear in a moment, a new moment of crisis, that Jews must live and act before God, so that Buber's own audience might be emboldened to figure out how to live and act Jewishly in their own time. And this is very much in line with what Buber writes in Moses. Quote, the true Navi, the true prophet, announces a present that requires human choice and decision, a present in which the future is being prepared. The sheer humanism of Buber's understanding of the Bible is evident in his discussion of a message brought by the prophet Samuel to King Saul in a passage that appears prominently in his biographical, autobiographical reflections. And I suspect this is a passage um, that you could uh, recite more or less with me. This is, of course, the moment when Saul has spared the life of the defeated King Agag, violating God's command that he kill him. Samuel has has arrived to report that for this choice, Saul will lose his dynastic kingship. Uber writes of his difficulty with this passage, writing that he cannot believe that what Samuel is bringing to Saul is a message of God. Samuel must 
have misunderstood. Samuel must be making a mistake. How could it be that Saul will be punished for saving a life? Buber writes, quote, man is so created that he can understand, but does not have to understand what God says to him. God does not abandon the created man to his needs and anxieties. He provides him with the assistance of his word. He speaks to him, he comforts him with his word. But man does not listen with faithful ears to what is spoken to him. Already in hearing, he blends together command of heaven and statute of earth, revelation to the existing being and the orientations that he arranges himself. Even the holy scriptures of man are not excluded, not even the Bible. What is involved here is not ultimately the fact that this or that form of biblical historical narrative has misunderstood God. What is involved is the fact that in the work of throats and pens out of which the text of the Old Testament has arisen, misunderstanding has again and again attached itself to understanding. The manufactured has been mis mixed with the received. We have no ob objective criterion for the distinction. We have only faith. It's very easy when reading Buber's biblical commentaries and looking at the sheer volume of words to think that the historical outweighs the saga in importance. But if we bring the commentaries into uh, the context of everything or of much more of what Buber wrote, and in particular, the idea of Hebrew humanism and the references to the Bible that he makes in the context of Zionist writings, like that essay, Children of Amos, or Children of Amos, um, we see that the person who is able to um, hear the saga, to recognize, to separate out that history which threatens to become that sort of degenerate antiquarian um, immersion in the past, if you can rise above it to hear the saga as saga, to hear it as a usable past which will teach you or instruct you to make sense of your present as God would have you, then um, there's a possibility for a present and a future. Even the prophets can misunderstand, but um, every moment is a new moment um, in which to interpret and to make sense and to move, hopefully, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to open to the floor for the question at the end of the both speakers. So our second speaker is the well-known author of the text as Tao, Professor Stephen Kepnes. He is a professor of world religion and profes professor of religion and Jewish studies in Col Colgate University. And he is also the director of Chapel House and director of the Fund for Society Study of World Religions. He is the author of several books. The most recent one is The Future of Jewish Theology, published in uh, Oxford in 2013. Now we look forward to listening his presentation entitled Buber as a Theologian. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, Sam. Um, I went to the uh, Divinity School at the University of Chicago, and this is my first time back after about 35 years. Wow. So the first thing I did when I walked into the building was go into the, um, to the right. The first office near the elevator was Paul Ricoeur's office. I just remember just waiting out there and for record. And uh, then I came up the second floor. I think the second floor was David Tracy's office, which I spent a lot of time in. Walked in the classroom where Gilkey gave his lectures on Kierkegaard. Um, and uh, Christine Kelp, I, Kelp, I was uh, at the uh, Disciples Divinity House. <clears throat> First Jewish kid that was at the Disciples Divinity House. I don't know why I ended up staying there, but it was great. I had a lot of friends there. Um, so uh, it's, 
It's somewhat uh, personal for me to be back here and to be in this building in Swift Hall. And uh, also, um, Clark Ilpin's words about Niebuhr and Buber in the 50s and 60s. When I was at the, when I was at the Divinity School, it was still the heyday of Protestant theology. Uh, you know, it was already, the edges were beginning to fray or open up, however you want. I mean, there was no Jewish studies there. So I had to go to Israel to study with Paul. Um, but I think at this moment of 50 years uh, after the outside the death of Buber, it, is, um, it behooves us to think about the 50s and 60s and the legacy not only of Buber and the provocation of Buber, but also of uh, liberal Protestantism. Um, I, I think, you know, Buber wrote this book, The Eclipse of God. And I think it's still, I mean, I think it's totally relevant. We are at the eclipse of God. Not only that, we are at the eclipse of theology. Um, the theology program here at Chicago is nothing like it was when I was there. Uh, but not only that, everywhere you look in major universities, we don't do theology, thank God for the Catholics. Um, and Jews, what is theology? That's what I'm going to talk about. But Jews, you know, Buber was always weird because he did theology. But if you look at the Bible, every page is about God, so I, I, don't, I don't get that one. But um, We're also at the eclipse of humanism. We're at the end of humanism. The, all this discussion about the existential self and the decision that the human being makes at the moment, it almost sounds naive or, I mean, who believes that anymore? In the great heroic human being, at the historical moment, who's gonna change that moment through his own, mainly his, but you know, or her own individual strength to stand up to God, politic, political leaders, everything. Those guys, you know, Martin Luther King. I mean, we that whole. I remember I wrote, you know, uh, Eric Erickson, Young Man Luther. You know, I think we're that's gone. I think, and also Buber's sense of not only the the, the ethical character. Um, but his whole business about the person of integrity beyond the it, and again, it sounds 1950s, but the it world has totally taken over. What Buber said, what all those existentialists and their cuteness predicted with the irrational man and Heidegger with technology, it has triumphed totally. And not only has it taken over Swiss the sciences, but it's taken over the humanities. <coughs> Everything is digital humanities. Everything is, you know, I have to have a, a chair of department. We have to have yesterday, we had to do a Facebook and an Instagram account. And, you know. <laughs> so if you can't use, if you can't, I heard this, this guy yesterday, what's the key to long life? I'm in my 60s, so maybe I want to listen. He said, the key is for you to learn how to use social media. <laughs> what? Those old people who can't use a computer will die. Well, maybe he's right. I mean, because they're, they're going to be cut off from the world. I mean, all right. So I do think, you know, in the usable, usable what is a usable boober? I think that's got to be one of the things that we discuss. We keep, we, it's very important to know Buber in the historical context, to know about the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And, uh, but we also have to face what is a usable Buber, because usable Buber means usable existentialists. It means usable Protestant theologians, the Niebuhrs, um, all those great figures uh, who taught at uh, at the Divinity School in, in, in Swift Hall, and we see some of their pictures. Um, the usable boober is a usable tradition. What, we're also on the eclipse of our traditions. It's the end, if any of you look at, well, I could say it, liberal Protestantism and liberal Judaism, we're done. You already know from what's going on in the liberal Jewish Theological Seminary. Those great traditions, Heschel, people aren't interested, it doesn't. So I think this is a great opportunity because Buber was one of those great figures 
of that great generation that produced some very, very uh, provocative, important, deep, and I'm going to say deeply theological works. For me, the usable Buber is a theologian. Uh, I know that that also is a very, it's a difficult topic for Jews. Um, because we don't do theology, we have law, and Christians have theology. Okay, that's the stereotype. Jews do Jewish thought. Makshevet Israel. Uh, we do Jewish thought. Uh, we don't do Jewish theology. But if you look at Buber, I think from the beginning to the end, from his beginning work on mysticism, through the dialogical period, his his encounter with Hasidut, as uh, Shaul showed us, was, was, it was a theological encounter. And I'm going to argue his best work was his biblical interpretation, which I see as biblical theology of a very deep sort. And when I say biblical theology of a very deep sort, I mean that Buber encountered God through scripture, you know my book, The Text is Thou. And as in the personal I-Thou relationship, he was changed by it. He says, well, you don't walk away from an I-Thou encounter without being changed. And to think that he spent all those years, and Claire showed, talked about his, his, all the work on the Bible, it was not changed fundamentally, not only in his, his intellectual that career, but in his... Um, very being and his notions of God would be, I think, crazy. So I don't think we can read the biblical writings through I and thou, which is what a lot of we do. We return and kind of regurgitate the I and thou existentialism. And that existentialism, the problem with that existentialism, I think this has been said by all the criti critics of existentialism, it was that this uh, you know, non-rational, unarticulatable experience that only the individual could know but couldn't even articulate. All right, I mean, great. But what do you do with that? Talk about a usable, how, what do you do, you, how, what, how would we do with that existential encounter which is hermetically sealed within the individual or the individual duad, dyad? So Buber said, language I will teach him. The it, that's what you got to, Buber, wake up. And I think Buber got the message, yes, and he found the it, he found language, a mediating language that publicly could be discussed in the Bible. And in that encounter, his theology moved beyond the theology of just the moment. The theology of just the inarticulable. He wrote about the Bible. We all read the Bible. And when you read his interpretations, I just think they're, they're incredible. He's a great biblical exegete slash theologian. And uh, I think that's the usable boober. And that's what I want to talk about. OK. So I went off script a little bit, because I got very emotional when I started thinking of Swift Hall, and <laughs> David Tracy, and Paul Ricoeur. Wow. So like I'm lucky that I could study with those people and be here, and I hated when I was here. Because <laughs> it was hard. It was really hard. I don't know, you guys graduate students, it was hard. Damn. You were in Chicago. It was always gray, and you always had a million things to read, and you never understood them, and you had to learn the language, you didn't know the language. Ah. But you know, we all struggled through it, and when we got our degrees then, I was happy, but I was only happy that I was at the University of Chicago, after I was at the University of Chicago, because then I had the, the degree, but while I was here, it was really tough. So I don't know what it's like now, but it was tough then. You know, it was like the military here. <laughs> okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up in my paper where I move from the uh, existential group Uber to the biblical Uber. So, okay, this is, I'm going to go into part three of Aina. Extended the lines of relations meet in the eternal vow. 
Every particular thou is a glimpse through to the eternal thou. By means of every particular thou, the primary word addresses the eternal thou. Through this mediation, the inborn thou is realized in each relation and consummated in none. It is consummated only in the direct relation with the thou that by its nature cannot become an it. The quotation is filled with the combination of metaphor and concept, opposition and synthesis, aphorism and poetry that is the hallmark of the book I and Thou. All of which is to say that for Buber, if we want to speak about real life, real relations, the human soul and God, we mustn't use language as we have in the past. The language of God as spirit must be a language that is pushed to its limits and returned to its origin. We must, in the terms of the beginning of I Thou, find primary words. Thus our quotation begins with a spatial and mathematical metaphor. Extended, the lines of relations meet. Parallel lines cannot meet in the world of it, but in the spiritual world of the Thou, they do meet. They meet in the eternal thou. But note now, note now how Buber moves from the spatial to the temporal. Thus he speaks not of the infinite thou, but of the eternal thou. Then he moves to a perceptual metaphor, offering that the relation to a particular thou provides a glimpse of the eternal thou. We cannot look directly at the eternal thou, we do not, as it were, see the eternal thou face to face, but we can catch a durchblich of him. Earlier in part one of I and Thou, Buber speaks of our individual I and Thou meetings as providing, quote, a look out towards the fringe, the psalm of the eternal thou. And mixing metaphors, he then says, we are aware of the breath, vasen of the eternal thou. The world of relations is a world of ends in themselves. I must see my personal thou as whole, as an end in herself. But seeing her thus, she still can become a, quote, mediation to the thou of all beings fulfillment. Indeed, the entire world, everything, person, plant, and animal, is a mediation to the eternal thou. And now Buber, renaming the ancient notion of the soul, speaks of the inborn thou, the thou within every human being that longs for relation, which is realized through each meeting, quote, but consummated only in the direct relation. What does this mean? The consummation of the inborn thou and the direct unmediated relation with the eternal thou. This notion, the direct relation with the eternal thou, always made me very nervous, or earlier on, when I first read this, I thought that there was no such thing as the direct relation with the eternal thou, and that we only had mediated relations to this thou. <coughs> but then I began to read Buber on the Bible, and then I saw that even as God says, no man can see my face and live, he also speaks to Moses face to face. I will soon turn to Buber's wonderful theological comments on the meeting between Moses and God at the burning bush, but at first I would like to return and finish with a few quotations from I and Thou. It is fairly all obvious that by the term eternal thou, Buber means new God. <laughs> Using terms like I and Thou, inborn thou, eternal thou, however, is part of a strategy to speak of God and the religious life in new terms, new language, and thereby to avoid old, worn out, and what Buber calls misused theological vocabulary. This is all part of Buber's revivalist and even spiritually revolutionary program of which we heard uh, earlier today and yesterday. But in the very next paragraph, after Buber writes so freshly and poetically about the eternal vow, he speaks up for the word that he has just replaced, i.e. the word God or God. Men have addressed their eternal thou with many names. 
and singing of him who was thus named, they always had the, the, the thou in mind. The first myths were hymns of praise. Then the names took refuge in the language of it. But all God's names are hallowed, for in them he is not only spoken about, but also spoken to. Here in talking about God language, Buber makes this universal claim. All prayers and myths address the same eternal vow. Wow. The wonderful, naive universality of the early 20th century. Would that we had the optimism and hope of those days today. Perhaps this is all we should do in this celebration of Buber's celebration of his 50th year here at site. Look back in awe at Buber's audacious universality, which was equally about the common spiritual goal and the common humanity of all human beings. However, there is more to say. For after this statement of religious universality, Buber then makes perhaps the most important <coughs> theological statement, his Buberian dogma. All of God's names are hallowed, for in them he is not only spoken about, he is spoken to. Speak to God, not about God. This could be a summary of all of Buber's theology. Speak to God, to God, not about God. All the rest is commentary. This statement summarizes his critique of traditional theology. For theologians spend too much time speaking about God, his nature, powers, commands, etc., without addressing God directly. And if you look, for instance, at Buber's biblical writings, most of them are about the dialogues, which he says, between heaven and earth. Dialogues of Abraham, of Moses, of the prophets, of Job, of the psalmist, all these dialogues that they have with God. So speaking to and not about God brings Buber to the dialogues in the Bible. And one might think it would also bring him, like his good friend Rosenzweig, to prayer and to worship. Here, however, Buber's own hang-ups and allergies to synagogue prohibited that. So obviously, when you speak to God, it's prayer, right? But he couldn't do that for whatever reason, and maybe some Buber scholar will elaborate on that. But perhaps Buber's call to God through whatever language and name people want to use brought him back precisely to the name for the eternal vow that Western religions use, i.e. God. And then we, we have this quote in, in the third part. Many men wish to reject the name God as a legitimate usage because it is so misused. Yeah, well, if I read Ein Thou, I would think maybe you're rejecting them. It is indeed the most heavy laden of all words used by men. For that very reason, it is the most imperishable and most indispensable. For he who speaks the word God and really has thou in mind addresses the true thou of his life. Buber's return to the word God at the end of I and Thou is, I think, indicative of much of his theology. It shows that despite his neologisms, and rejection of traditional Western theological language in general and Jewish language in particular, his goal is not to re reject, but to revive, to reinterpret and reinvigorate Jewish theology, not replace it. Now, I think we could have an argument on that. And that's kind of my overbelief. That is that Buber, in the end, functions to revive tradition, biblical theology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, even in his critique of the one before. This explains why we find throughout all his writings comments and discussions and uses of terms like transcendence, imminence, creation, revelation, repentance, redemption, mercy, justice. He uses all the traditional terms, albeit in new ways, but he uses them. 
as one of my students said, he still speaks out of the framework, the central framework of Judaism and Jewish theological categories and Jewish texts. In each case, Buber interrogates and interprets the traditional theological term, often using it in novel, way, no, no, novel ways, but finally not rejecting it. In the postscript script to I and Thou, Buber speaks to another traditional notion of God, and that is the notion of God as person. The description of God as a person is indispensable for everyone who, like myself, means by God not a principle, and like myself means not an idea, but who rather means by God, as I do, him who, whatever else he may be, enters into direct relation with us men, and thus makes it possible for us to enter into direct relation with him. The concept of a personal being is indeed completely incapable of declaring what God's essential being is, but it is both permitted and necessary to say that God is also a person. For those who know Buber's interlocutors, when he eschews a notion of God as principle or idea, he's probably talking about his elder statesman, Hermann Cohen, in the entire idealist tradition that goes back to Plato. My teacher, Paul Mendes Flor, has written in his interpretation of this paragraph, which I just read about God as person, has said, quoting, Buber neither says God is a person, nor does he say he is the eternal thou. He merely says that existentially we know, quote, God as a person, as the eternal thou who addresses us as our ultimate ever-present partner in dialogue. Mendes Flores' interpretation here hinges on this notion of existential knowing or existential knowledge. Existential knowledge arises in and through the moment of encounter and dialogue. Outside of that moment, no claims to truth in reality can be made. However, I might venture to disagree with my teacher. Sorry. But I think you're supposed to do that, right? <laughs> What's a teacher if you can't disagree with them? and say that I'm not sure that any Jewish notion of God as a person requires one to say that God's, quote, essential nature is as a person. Certainly in Maimonides' theology, we cannot say anything about God's essential nature. And we have a similar view in Kabbalah, which uses the notion of the Ein Sof to refer to God's essentially unknown nature. But if we grant Mendes Flor his view, it might be true that Buber's theology, as we find it in I and Thou, follows the lines of the Kantian critique, which says that no theological claim has validity and certitude, since epistemological certitude can only be one in the phenomenal world. This limits theology to the confines of the narrow ridge between scientific knowledge and noumenal knowledge that the European romantics and existentialists tried to carve out. Here, God is the eternal thou, can only be glimpsed for a moment in the I thou encounter. Here, as Reverend Greenberg once said, God could be called a God of the moment or a moment God that appears at one point in history and then disappears in another. But as we all know, Buber's work did not end in I and thou in the 1920s. After this, Buber immersed himself in reading, translating, and interpreting the Bible. And I would offer that if we really want to see Buber's theology at its best, it is to his biblical writings that we must turn. Here, I believe that Buber finds a new outlet for his theological concerns, and I would argue that his theology of God, as the eternal vow, develops and moves beyond the episodic and untold truths of existentialism toward the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the revelation of God to Moses. In Buber's encounter with the Bible, as I've written my first book, Buber did not merely read the Bible as a book, he encountered it as a thou. And as with all genuine I-thou encounters, Buber emerged different 
from what he was before the encounter. However, in his encounter with the biblical text as thou, Buber does not find an easy or simple faith. Indeed, he finds a difficult faith, what he even calls a suffering faith. But his faith is no longer limited by the Kantian issue of the lack of certitude that non-scientific knowing or existential knowing yields. Rather, Buber is now limited in his knowledge of God precisely because God is God. And God, as God, as an independent and transcendent being, simply cannot be captured and known through any human encounter, experience, language, or system of knowing and naming. To see Buber learning this in action, we need only to look at his encounter with the encounter of Moses at the burning bush. I know I'm kind of getting there in time. I'm, I'm okay. The name of God. Moses said to God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is my name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, a yeah, a shih, a yeah. He continued, thus shall you say to the Israelites, eh, yeah, sent me to you. And God said further to Moses, the Lord, or Yahweh, you take the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever. This is my appellation for all eternity. Buber suggests that in this text, Moses, who asks some of the most audacious questions in all of the Bible, asks here a truly grand question. Moses asked God to give out his personal name, his cell phone, his, you know, social media, his Facebook. Give me your Facebook, God. Hey. <laughs> the general name for gods in the Bible is El or Elohim. But Moses and God know this. And God has already revealed himself as the God of Moses' ancestors, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it appears that Moses is asking for neither a formal name nor for an identification of God as the self-same God of his ancestors. Rather, he is asking for a personal name, God's first name, or perhaps, if one can say this, God's nickname. Buber suggests that names like this are true names. Quote, it is the essence of the person distilled from his real being so that he is present in the very name, Buber says. And Buber also suggests that through uttering this name and uttering it in the correct pronunciation, including the correct rhythm and correct attitude, the personal name calls to the other as thou. In Exodus 3, verse 12, God had already reassured Moses I will be there with you, a monk. But when God reveals his name to Moses, he receives an even deeper assurance. A asher, a Buber argues that this expression should not be translated with the abstract and static statement of pure existence, the I am that I am of the King James Bible. Buber instead suggests that the translation needs to convey the dynamic sense of, quote, happening, coming into being, being there, being present, being thus and thus, but not being in an abstract sense. The second and third words, asher, ahir, should be translated as I will be present. Therefore, Buber suggests the translation, I will be present as I will be present, as the best translation for a yesha yeah. Buba further says, Yudhe Vavhe indeed states he will always be present, but at any given moment as the one who he is then, in that given moment. He who promises his steady presence, his steady assistance, refuses to restrict himself to definite forms of manifestation. Buber says, now Buber seems to get really excited as he says that the brilliance of the personal name for God is that it revealed to Moses 
that the, the, the name of it, Moses is that at once it gives his assurance of presence. God assures his presence, quote, his steady presence, and also prefers for God the exact way and form in which his presence will appear. This may be as creator, judge, savior, fighter, or even as a still small voice. In his very name, God assures that he will remain unknown, unpredictable, absolutely free. God remains in control of his presence. It cannot be conjured, evoked, or demanded by humans. Yet, at the same time, God assures Moses and Buber, I might add, that he is not merely a moment God, not only a God of encounter. In this case, the encounter at the burning bush, God will be present whenever and wherever he is needed. Now I just want to turn one more small example in the book, Two Types of Faith. In the War of Independence, 1948 or 1947 to 1950 in Israel, Buber wrote the book, Two Types of Faith. Here he distinguishes between Jewish faith as emunah, which he translates as trust, and Christian faith as pistis or belief. Emunah, he tells us, is faith, faith that is rooted in a people, and pistis is an individual acknowledgement. Uber, emunah originated in the actual experiences of Israel, which were to it experiences of faith, small than great numbers of people, first in the search for open pasture land, then of land for free settlement, make their journey as being led by God. This fact that Israel experienced its way to, way to Canaan is the birth of emunah, Emunah is the state of, quote, preserve it, also to be called trust, in an invisible guidance which yet gives itself to be seen. Here I would suggest Buber has further developed and augmented the faith of Moses with a theology of emunah, or trust. The theology places God not in a bush on a remote mountain seen only by Moses, but in the very myths of a people, the people of Israel and the emerging nation of the small state of Israel. Here, Buber has found a faith in God powerful enough to, as he himself put it in 1950, quote, help me endure in faith this terrible war. This does not mean that Buber buys into any religious nationalism about Israel as the dawn of redemption. Other people, Sam has clearly showed us that. But it does mean that his faith has gone beyond the transitory moment of the I-thou relation to take on a constancy, power, and depth, depth to sustain him through the most difficult part of his and his nascent nation's life. So to conclude, I would argue that the theological issues of faith, trust, and relationship with God were never far from Buber's personal and scholarly agenda. And these concerns motivated him from the beginning of his studies of mysticism to the end of his encounter with the biblical texts. Buber's writings will only be appropriately assessed and appreciated and made useful today when we who read him see him and assess him and appreciate him as a theologian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to open to the floor for the questions. Please raise your hand and identify yourself and please uh, address to this, each speaker. Okay, yeah, Professor. Very quickly speaking, if what you said, I don't know if you that uh, theology is speaking about God, and Buber actually wanted us to speak to God, 
and not about God, the more you the illusion. Well, I think that that's the doctrine of I and thou. Um, and I do think he moves beyond that. To recognize, because if you're only thinking about God, I think thinking too, so I think he moves beyond his, his own dogma. If you're only speaking to God, then as I said, it's, it's hermetically sealed monist. It's, you know, that was, I think, the problem of, of the direct relationship to the eternal vow in, in the book. And, now, and that's why I always thought that was not really important. It was really all about those mediated relations. But I think when he gets to the Bible, um, he finds a way to speak about God through biblical exegesis. And so then it's not an about God of an of a, I, it, conceptual. I mean, I had a whole piece about that, you know, propositional. You know, it's not, thir he never gets to my, anything like my mind is 13 principles. I mean, that, of course, existentialism wiped that away. So then there, you know, but there is a retrieval of some, you know, of a new form of theology. It's not so new, but in the contemporary, in our, and for today, you know, we all, are, we're all kind of fed up with proposition theologies in general. It's not what we're, we're, we're doing. Um, but we do, I think we still want to and have to find ways of formulating a theology. And I think uh, an exegetical theology is Buzzy's work and others. I think, and even, you know, work on Hasidism, that's the way the Jews have always done it. And we can, and we can redo it. And, and you know, that's the, the incredible thing about the exegetical mood. You have the same text, but you can, you know, interpret it for your contemporary world. And I think Buber moved into that. And, yeah. Okay. Yes, please. He delineates them himself, and um, you know, it, it, the, as a methodology, it sort of develops over the three books. But by the time of Moses, there's an introductory chapter where he says. We have saga, we have history, this is what they each are. And then as you go through the chapters, at least in Moses, he's primarily concerned with creating this or discovering this history, but then every now and then there's a pause to say, here we have a moment of saga. And does he introduce the moments in which he's reading? I mean, is he praying in which level he's reading? Or yeah, no, it's very clear. Is there a sense for which, is there a sense of how his hermeneutic style is similar to similar to contemporary Protestant or is that not So that's the conversation he wants to be a part of. Um, and actually, um, one of my very favorite lines that Paul has ever written is he comments, these are the first books that Buber wrote with footnotes. And they, like a third of the books um, is taken up with footnotes. And uh, so that's, he's trying to be a part of the German biblical critical conversation, um, Gunkel and, and all of the others. And uh, you know, those are exactly the people who don't take him very seriously. But yeah, um, they, do they him? no, no. And he never gets that position in uh, that academic position in Bible that he wanted either. Yes, please. I guess what, what interests me is what Professor Fishman calls this notion of Uber as carving out this third alternative. Um, so that in terms of history, on the one hand, we have this episodic reading of these subjective, uh, conceptualized events, and it's not clear how we can relate to them, or just these episodic discrete moments. Um, and then on the other hand, we have this antiquarian version of history. And what I heard him saying was, let's carve this third alternative where we're providing this narrative account. And then in terms of theology, again, it's episodic on the one hand, right? That becomes this closed hermeneutic circle, as you were saying, um, in, in the Ohio now text. And then on the other hand, you have God as the concept, which perhaps matches on to this antiquarian version of history. And so that made me think 
well as the narrative account becomes the third alternative in the version of history, then this idea of God, of having a faithful relationship to God, um, becomes the, the, the third alternative in the theological side of the um, hmm. So I guess, I guess one question is just, do you think that I'm interpreting your talks correctly and that they, they parallel in this to a certain extent? Hmm. And then my other question has to do with what is happening with the way in which Uber understands our relationship to time? So that on the episodic side of things, it's as if he's synthesizing the moment. On the other side of things, God as a concept for this antiquarian history, instead of it being the moment, it's about eternity. And then that third path seems to actually be about extension in time. So extension of trust or a narrative account of history. Um, yes, that's very good. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that um, you know that's one thing that Rosenzweig tried to pick up on uh, very deeply, but. Um, but let's stick with Buber. So, yes, I, I think you're right that the that the notion of saga uh, is, you know, the at the kernel of the saga is the the that ineffable experience. But then, the saga and the way it's written tries to pick up and embody some of the, you know, some of the lessons, whatever, of the story and pass them over, pass them on to the generations. And then, you know, that gets picked up in biblical narrative, but also in worship and liturgy, like the Passover Seder, you know, is this attempt in some ways to bridge the time of that time to the time not today. And, and so narrative theology, I think, in general, wants to make a connection between creation, time in the middle as revelation, as, as filled with meaning and purpose, ending up in redemption or eternity. And I think Buber wants to kind of hold on to a, the historical kernel of that saga. Uh, whether he's successful or not, I, I don't know, but, but Rosenzweig is just gonna cut out, you know, just doesn't care about history and tries to go into a kind of an atemporal myth, mythological time. So I don't know if I've totally, but I, I think that now the theology in general, general tries to make, or the Bible provides us with the template through which time as one moment after the other becomes a circle with, and also meaningful with a creation as the beginning, revelation in the middle, and redemption at the end. So um, <clears throat> I went back and forth in my mind with whether or not I agreed with you just now. And um, <laughs> I had, I think this builds on your comment, which is a question I had for you, Stephen, which is you, you asserted that, for, yeah, I'm sorry. It's partially that I am not sure yet what I want to say. Um, Stephen, I heard you asserting that the eternal thou, um, or Buber's notion of God in I and thou is a moment God, but then in God in Buber's biblical writings or the God that Buber found in the Bible is not a moment God. But in what sense is the God of the Bible not a moment God, present from moment to moment? If you think about God from the perspective of the generations of Israelites who were stuck in Egypt while God was busy doing other things and more or less forgot about them, there was they had no continuity. You know, I, so I think there's a sense in which the God of the Bible is still a moment God. So that's, that's one thought. But then more directly to your question or your comment, I think the struggle with saga is that what Buber doesn't want to do is to turn the moments of God's presence in the Bible into propositions. Right? That it doesn't, he doesn't want he wants to escape the conversation of, do you believe that Moses spoke to God? Do you believe that God was present in a burning bush? Do you believe in Revelation at Sinai? Um, which is a question that Jews are still very much hung up on. 
Um, he wanted to escape that and to be able to say, we all know because of our own experiences, we know that God can be present. What we get from the Bible is not the argument that God can be present. We get the argument that you have to do something about the presence of God. And so, yes, time maybe collapses in some sense because God is present then, God is present now, but there's also a great separation because the person today responds in their today. They don't respond as the biblical person responded. It's not a script. It's not really very much of a model at all other than they act, and therefore you have to figure out how to act yourself where you are. So, Can I, I respond to your thing? Yeah, uh, please. I, 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 no, no. Just quickly, I mean, the notion of emuna is precisely that when I'm not in, when I, I I don't know when I'm not overcome by the the glory the kavod of God, I still trust that God is there. And the even deeper one is that dafka in my moment of despair. When I'm suffering, I see God is there too. So there's no place where God is not present. That's a yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my fault. I don't understand the, the moments when, he's, when God's not there. But Emuna, and Buba learned that when I say the faith of sufferers. It's a much deeper form of, of faith than the nice, you know, overpowering uh, fire that's not consumed. So, and that's the, re that's the religious life. It's... it's it seems to me that's the deeper form of that even when, I, when I'm in the worst time, I know God is there. And that's what Buber learned. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this line of thinking as well. And clearly, there is a connection between the papers, the notion of musical house, and the notion of the exegetical, yes, if you will, the sort of depth, the story, yes. graphic account that you're giving to uh, Stephen. Uh, but I think, um, I think what's so frustrating for, for listeners is that Andy Buber is part of our world has moved uh, hermeneutically to recover what thinkers labeled the sash, the, the subject matter of the exegetical text, which comes to the fore in the saga, comes to the fore in the exegetical work. Uh, but what's so frustrating to listeners of this sort of um, uh, God Marian term um, is that Buber just resists. The, the ability and the willingness to establish what would be criteria for exegetical activity. So if you've got this wonderful notion of the youth in the past, which is really a disanticipatory of a pragmatic move, right? I mean, there's, a, there's the notion that the text offers certain kinds of normative hypotheses that by virtue of their, um, their existence in the text can be usable potentially for conversations today in that moment of decision, in that moment of historical specificity, um, and that we can engage in a kind of retrieval, hypothetical. So it's almost, you know, do we uh, reconsider from an imaginative past instead of do we consider from an imaginative future? Uh, but the problem with Cooper is that you, you, you look to find the questions that he says the community can ask exegetically. What would be the criteria for a useful past? Um, why is he so reticent to say what it means is when, when he reads the I will be there, I will be there? Why is he so reticent to make a move like Cohen makes, where Cohen says the prophet searches to overcome matters of suffering? Why can't he invoke the concern for overcoming suffering as a criteria for what would deem a. Uh, uh, He's Booper, what do you want from him? <laughs> He's not Herman Cohen. He's not a philosopher. He's not. A, he's a aesthetic, exegetical theologian. You're right. I mean, we we can still criticize him, but you know. The question is, how do we have so much evidence so valuable? So we want to ask ourselves the question: What more could we could we contribute? Okay, that's that's. I think that's okay. Okay, I think that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, it's time, but uh, um, um, well, there is no program before lunch break, so you can ask uh, one more. How much time do you want to let this go? I think that's great. Yeah. That's great.
goes. Well, I mean, if someone wants to respond, go for it. If you are, okay. So uh, you want to end? Okay. So you got all these um, hands here. Okay, so the, so three uh, questions. Um, uh, okay, okay. So the person. Yeah, just. I understand how perhaps we can do theology on a level where we're in very mode, but in light of the fact, like we heard yesterday, there's a strong problem in philosophical lightweight. This extreme reticence to be categorized into any position. This asymptomatic approach. This uh, denial of propositional uh, thinking with regards. I'm wondering what's left for theology if we take all this in mind. Um, what kind of theology are you doing when there's no category, no system, no proposition, no full-fledged philosophical approach? <laughs> um, you ever read Midrash or anything? I mean, they, they, those guys don't have criteria of, of adequacy and... And they produce, you know, this is a form of theology. It's not philosophical theology. Uh, your question kind of is why, why is he not doing philosophical theology? Buber does what he does. Let's treasure that. Let's, but certainly you're right. You critique it. That's why we go, you, we go beyond. I mean, there's another thing. But don't, there's a treasure here. It's just like, you know, like people like in Swift Hall, Iliade, we're all gone beyond. But there's something in Iliade and, and, you know, it's the sacred, it's the moment of retrieval, it's not only the critical. Buber had that, that's all he did. He did retrieval, he did, you know, some sort of theological, I thou, let's, what, let's, yeah, take that. And then you're right, it, these are the critiques that, that he, that's why people said he wasn't a philosopher. I agree, he wasn't a philosopher. Can I, can I answer also? Yeah, sure. So in an earlier version of this talk, and hopefully in the final version of the uh, chapter that I owe Sarah, um, that's quite overdue, um, I also talked about Heschel. And I talked about Heschel and Buber as two different models for political activism. And that image of Heschel walking, you know, arm in arm with, uh, with King and the, the famous, you know, I felt that my legs were praying and basically you, and the, when Heschel said, I felt my legs were praying when I was marching with King. And, um, you know, this is, it's this line, this image that you basically can't talk about Jewish political activism without citing those two. And we don't have that picture of Buber. Um, you know, I don't know that he ever, I mean, thought it, it would be quite an image to see him at, uh, at a rally of some kind. But um, I really, for me at least, I think that what's so difficult about taking Buber seriously is that he is not giving you the material to be able to say, here's how, here's how Buber read this verse, or here's what we learn from Buber about this Parsha or whatever. He's not going to give you homiletics. But I, I think, and I, I think that this is also what Sam was saying yesterday, is that Buber is really saying to you, get up and figure out what is right and go do something about it. And it might be what he did, which is write books and editorials and you know, be basically an enormous pain in the ass of your government, but go do something. And you might end up in the position of Shmuel and be wrong, horribly wrong, but, but you have to act. And you know, if, the moment, if we are in the moment of the eclipse of the existentialist, well, Eclipses end. I mean, I hope that's part of it, right? It all, it, it comes around. And uh, to me, that's, we can't be fair to Buber without letting ourselves feel that he's making a demand of us. And instead of trying to fit him into some other category and throwing our hands up and saying, well, he doesn't, he doesn't fit. Well. I'm not saying there's nothing in the world study. This is not a philosopher. That's not at all. Right. No, I, I know. Some box one way or another. Especially since he spends so much time explicitly saying, don't do that. Well, I'm trying to get him do. out of the existentialist and say you know, the biblical brought him out, brought him to language. Did he mm. get to conceptual philosophy? No. But he, that was, I mean, that, you know, he, had, he still was who he, who he was as a scholar. But I think he did move. And I think, you know, obviously other people like Professor Fishbane, I think, 
you know, it was in that tradition, if I can say that, of, of Buber, Rosenzweig, uh, and, and, and it goes, it gets developed, um, and we're still, so, but it, so it's a tradition, I think, that, uh, that should continue, and I, and I think Buber, I'm trying to get his place in there, okay. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank again our speakers for the very interesting and stimulating contributions and the, all the participants for the valuable following discussion. Thank you. Um, our afternoon session starts at 1.30 at here, yeah, so um, uh, let's move on the lunch break. Thanks.